Hello. Welcome to Wednesday. Hello, peoples. The Seth Williams Show with Chris Hagen. How are you doing today? I'm good. Just finished one show recording the the last Chris Hagen Presents of the year, and then... um. Then right into the studio for this. I think I was out of the studio maybe 20 minutes. <laughs> yes. And then um, we have one more week after this, and then we are done for the year. Yeah. The only reason we had to record early for Chris Aiken Presents is that Eric is um, this this high roller. Uh, he's he's going to be playing um, the Chris Angel benefit next Monday. Oh, Jesus. So he's, he's going to be going out hanging with Chris Angel and all those people next monday for some benefit to raise money for something something so how does his head fit through the door <laughs> you know he's as low-key as it gets now the rest yeah. of his band i don't know but eric is pretty <laughs> you know he's just like he, he even talking to him he's like yeah i gotta go do this chris angel thing you know and you know i was i still hate missing the show i'm like dude you're going to hang with like one of the elite uh, mu mu magicians of our time yeah and you're gonna go play this cool, great benefit. An English and, celebrity, yeah. Yeah, and 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 you can um you could do that, or you could come here and do Chris Aiken presents. Go have fun. Go play. You're gonna play round and round or whatever with a bunch of A list guests. You know, like Slash. I think Slash was at this thing last year. Yeah, some people have it real tough. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, yeah. Hey, believe me, I'm the one that, that got lucky there. I mean, how do I get a you know, a burgeoning rock star as my co-host. The life of a rock star. Yeah. Makes it fun, though. And then you get stuck with my stupid fat ass. <laughs> now, you get stuck with me. Who are you kidding? Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, I don't know about all that. but okay, got everything work out at Charlie's. Yep, got the car back last night. Good That's good. Good to hear. Good Gunner, to hear. I don't know if you showed you how to use it yet or your sister-in-law how to use it yet, but it is... Uh, it's a fairly easy and actually gets fun to drive after a while like that. Yeah, it's got to be like, it's like a video game now, right? It is. It's kind of like, <laughs> like you're playing pole position, like for real though. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Not that any child would remember what pole position is, but yes. Um, well, I remember. Cause... Like, now I can tap half my leg while I'm listening to music and, and, and I don't have to worry about the gas. That's good. <laughs> so you got it down now, huh? The only thing that sucks about it is like when you get in and out of the car, you got to take the leg off. At least I do because my arm's my right leg. Right. And so now every time I go to get gas or stop to get a pop or something like that, it's like slap out the leg off, and then people stare at you as you're getting out, and then you put it on. And, uh. yeah. That's when you you just got to think of inventive things to say at them when they're staring at you. Just. You want to watch me take my dick off too? You know, so, something that they'll just be like, ah! and they'll be horrified and they'll run away. <laughs> See, I've gotten so used to doing it. It actually looks kind of cool. I'm almost like a uh, like a NASCAR pit worker. Right. You know, I get out, leg comes out, leg goes into the, the fake leg, up and walking. Like, it, and it's like, how fast can I do it? And, and, <laughs> it actually is kind of fun now. You ought to get some of the audio from like a pit crew. And every time that goes on, just play, you know, every time you're getting out of your car, have it on your phone, just you're turning to get out of the car and you're, ree, 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 you know, all the, all the noises from a yeah, car. That'd, that'd be, be cool. great. <laughs> People are going to stare at you anyway. Might as well have fun with them. Yeah. Make them uncomfortable. <laughs> I practiced in the, uh, I heart parking lot. It's too bad you didn't crash into something. Well, I wanted to. Yeah, I wanted kind of like a. Hey, this is where I got fired, and then I'm driving right. now once again. I'm getting my life back together, kind of experience. Uh, you're past those cocksuckers now, I anyway. Am. Seth is now tow motor qualified. Look at that. <laughs> uh, I don't. I mean, what is that? What does it mean? Tow motor. I don't know. How would you get up into a tow motor? Is the real question. Well, I have another leg. Yeah, I guess you'd you'd have to get in on the one side though. Yeah, yeah. I guess you could. I'm, I'm sure there's one-legged tow motor dri drivers. Should the Bob Franz thing ever not work out, you've got the. I'll become a tow, tow, tow motor driver. There you go. <laughs> Speaking of the Bob Franz show, yesterday for uh, Strictly Speaking, that's his TV show. Yeah. We interviewed this guy, Collier Landry. 
Okay. Don't know who that is. He, when he was like 11 years old, I think he grew up in Mansfield. Okay. And when he was like 11 years old, got up, heard noises in his parents' bedroom or something like that, and found his mother missing or something. And apparently he testified against his father in the murder of his mom. Whoa. When he was like 11 years old. And it's a hell of a story. It's a really interesting story. So when this episode comes out, you got to watch it. But there's a movie out there called Murder in Mansfield, I believe it is. Okay. But What's it on? Do you know? I don't know. Maybe you can see. But it's a, It's about this. I think this Collar Landry actually did it. But he's got like a, a podcast now with his girlfriend. His girlfriend's pretty hot. And she survived something like something. Uh, yeah, that's him. Yeah, there he is. He's an interesting, uh, interesting guy to say the least. But his story is is really something. Tara sure. Newell, Tara Newell, N E W E L L is his girlfriend. Tara T A R A T E R R A T E R R A N E W E W E L L. Oh yeah, let's put her on the screen instead of him. Because <laughs> we're, we're we're hetero guys. He is a good-looking dude, though. He's got, like, those piercing blue eyes. He's yeah, a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> like, we care. <laughs> I, I don't know. Enough I met her yesterday, guy. too. She, uh, she has a story where she, I, I guess, I didn't hear her whole story. I had to leave, but they're both survivors of, like, serial killers and stuff. Wow. Yeah, she's hot. Is that how they found each other? Like, through through their stories or whatnot? Yeah, yeah. She survived some of the killing of... You gotta look up her story. It's something interesting too. Let's she did her. like a, another episode also, and now they have like a podcast together called like the Survivor Squad. There's a lot of that true crime in the podcasting world. There is, and I like it. I go to bed listening to true crime stuff. I listen. You know what, I, dude? It's funny because I, I have two things that I go to sleep listening to: either the Charlie Sheen Anger Management Channel, right on, um, on like Roku Channel or whatever. Or um, interrogations on YouTube, where I'll just find myself another eight-hour interrogation of somebody that you know whacked his family or something. Yeah, and and I, it's no wonder I'm such an angry prick. That's that's what I'm listening to when I'm sleeping. But for whatever reason, when I listen to that true crime stuff about murdering people's families and stuff, I actually get relaxed and fall asleep. Yeah, I, Is it, I, I think it's that whole thing of well, at least I'm, at least my life's not as bad as theirs. At, le- at least my life's better than what they're going through. <laughs> that could definitely be it. Yeah, who what, is, what is ter- her? Yeah, can, do you have a story on her? I do. Um, a notorious con artist mur- ambushed his stepdaughter, which ultimately led to his death. Uh, Tara Newell, alongside her boyfriend, Colin Landry, who is also a survivor of domestic violence, have since used their trauma to help others. Who is Tara Newell? She is arguably best known for ta- for taking down Dirty John Meehan, yeah, the subject is. of the 2018 Golden Globe nominated Netflix series of the same name. What's the same name? Dirty John? Dirty John, I'm assuming. I have not seen that one, but let me add that to the list of things I need to watch. She's good looking though. She's a little small. Yeah, she's thing. a she's a little hottie. She's like um I don't know. She's like what's what's that girl's name? The American. She's like Kelly Clarkson without the donuts. Yeah. <laughs> but her and uh, Colin Landry were in the studios yesterday. Actually came into town. Oh, nice. Are they from here? Or? Well, he's from Mansfield and stuff. And so okay. The they know the uh, the guy that runs these True Blue Studios here in town, and so they came up to the studios. They had lunch, I guess, in town. They went to the Casa Noel in Medina, and then. Uh, Kind of hung out for a while, and then Bob interviewed both of them separately. Did hour long episodes with each one of these people. Nice, they're very interesting, very very good stories, and you know some really tough questions that guy had to answer. And you, know, you got to watch it, but it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of interesting. You know, when he was saying, "Hey, did you forgive your dad? We you killed your mom." Man. Yeah, Ooh, that's brutal. Yeah. So it was it was a uh, it was something to listen to. Sure. How is True Blue doing? Or strictly speaking, is it is it gaining? Gain an audience? Oh yeah, yeah, it's gaining traction, and uh, it's it's cool because like it's fun getting these guests, but it's very stressful. And, and sure, you know, there's a lot of times where I think Bob wants guests that 
I, I you know, we're just not getting yet because we're just starting this thing. Yeah. Basically. I mean, mm-hmm. so we're not going to be able to get. Obama's not coming on. Trump isn't coming on. But we're not going to be able to get the A listers no, just yet. Yeah, you gotta you gotta start with the the guy that served Obama lunch once. And so you know what I'm trying to do is get stories and topics that are really interesting. Sure. And then go from there as far as you know. Once we have content built up, then mm-hmm. it's easier to go to the, the publicist and say, "Hey, look, this is all this, you know from Gilly." Yeah, yeah, I do. I do it all the time. You know, this is what we've done. Now give me the good stuff. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> but, I mean, we had some great people on. We had Dean Cain on, which was good. Yeah. I saw you had Bernie on, Bernie Coase Bernie on. on uh, John Rich from you know, Country Fame. Yeah. And he's, he's been on. And Alan Dershowitz has been on. Yeah. So you're getting decent guests. I mean, those aren't those are all A-list guests. Yeah. Those are good guests. Yeah. Well, and it seems like again, I'm I know nothing about it. You you have to tell me if I'm full of shit or not. But it seems like Roku is behind this or is supporting it, just because like I was I literally right before the show was on, I I was out in the other room watching the Roku channel. Yeah. On on my Roku because I have a Roku in the living room, and Roku just changed their interface. I noticed. To where now the first icon, like the first channel package that you can click, yeah. is live TV. So, and then you click it, and then it brings up all the Roku channel stuff. But they they just installed that, so well, they're clearly seeing some kind of growth or oh yeah or something in the fast channels. So yeah, it definitely. I mean, the true blue flash <clears throat> fast channels are definitely. I mean, it's it's good. Mm-hmm. So you can do watchtrueblue.com, I believe it is, but Roku channel five twenty nine, yeah. and then but TCL TVs mm-hmm. also carry this channel. Sure. And then Plex, like the Plex. Yeah, uh, Plex is great. So they carry it. Tubi is going to be carrying it soon. Okay. Which is another big one. Yeah. Uh, so there are plenty of ways to watch it. Which you know, and, it and is if, free. You don't have to pay for it unless you, if you want to subscribe to True Blue, you can. It's like five bucks a month or something like that. But what do you get you for subscribing? To. Do you get something extra? Well, you, I mean, there's a lot of like uh, cool stuff with um, like Chris Hansen has a great show on there. It's like to catch predator basically, but it's called Takedown. Okay. okay. There's a lot of good stuff there, and then there's a lot of uh, other crime stuff that's on there too. And it's, it's I mean, it's worth. I have the I paid for the five bucks a month. Okay. It's shocking. I actually work for the company. I work for True Blue. I mean, I'm employed by True Blue. And you I, can't so, get a free sub. I mean, I probably could, but I haven't asked. <laughs> you might but fire I, you over it. No. Yeah. So, but, <laughs> I, but I pay for the uh, the five bucks a month, and I think it's worth it. I mean, we watch a lot. Okay. The Chris Hansen stuff is amazing, dude. I mean, like, I like Bob Show because I work on it. Right. Sure. But the Chris Hansen stuff is just my favorite. <laughs> Did you watch it to catch predator stuff? Oh right? yeah, absolutely. So he's got this one guy that they show. They call him Glory Hole John. I think it is. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Because he has like a like a setup supposedly in his house where he's asking young supposed young kids to come over to his house. He's got a glory hole that he wants them to. You know, stick his thing into, and he's going to service him and all this stuff. All right, and he wow. thinks he's talking to young boys, right? Sure. And so they, they they bust this guy, and <laughs> he's laying on the ground. He's all handcuffed and stuff. And Chris Hans is the best man. This guy's bitching. Glory Hole John bitching because his back hurts and stuff. He's like, um, Glory Hole John, I think your back pain is the least of your problems right now. Yeah. <laughs> He's the best. Maybe, maybe sitting down and having a brownie will make you feel better with some <laughs> lemonade. Yeah, I don't know if there's any clips on YouTube of Glory hmm. Old John, but I'll, yeah. I'll look that up here and say, "Look, here's here's my my knowledge of Chris Hansen. Check this out." The classic metal show. Hmm. <laughs> that sounds very familiar. Very suspicious. Very predator-like. Anyway, Chris Hansen here of Hansen vs. Predators, and to catch a predator, you know, I'm going to need everybody to have a seat because I've been going through some transcripts in a recent predator case involving teachers, and I just need you to know that I'll be submitting those cases to Judge Aiken for a ruling, all right? So in the meantime, behave yourselves, and remember, I'll be watching 
Oh, and uh, hail and kill. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> That's awesome. How great is that? That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, Hanson's awesome, man. I get the party that we went to at True Blue. He was there, and I had him actually... And Bob recorded it, a video of him telling me to take a seat. <laughs> take a seat right over there. <laughs> What's his name? Glory Hole what? Glory Hole John, I think it was. Glory Hole John? Boy, if the FBI ever comes against my computer. <laughs> yeah, put, put Chris Hansen in front of it. All right, yeah. If I didn't do that. Yeah, I don't Chris. think you just want to put Glory Hole in your, in your search engine. Chris Hansen. The new Chris. Glory Hole Jerry? That might be it, yeah. And there's some glory hole Jerry. Oh, these are like 12 minutes, though. Hold on. See if I can't find like a two-minute glory hole Jerry on oh, 26. Have they gotten this guy like a bunch of times or something? There's a ton of them on this guy. They may have, but they're all like 30 minutes long. Well, That's we a... play. Yeah. Play a little play, of it. Play a little of it. Do I have sound? Underage boy, the Viper boy is talking line. to a guy oh, named this is... Jerry, who says he is 19 years old. No, he has not given me a location, but he said he's. Yeah, fast forward because this is the episode. Glory Hole's not in there yet, so there you go. Is this him? Yeah. yeah there you go. Meeting him. Meeting who? Oh, no. Him. Who is it? Travis. Travis. And what's your name? Jerry. Jerry. Jerry, where did you come Glory from? Glory Hole Jerry didn't. The other side of the park. Right in this neighborhood? No, on the other side of the park. The other side of the park. Yeah. And how did you meet Travis? What do you mean, how that meeting? How did you meet him? How did you find out that you should... He was on Grindr. On Grindr. And what was the discussion on Grindr? Sponsored by Grinder. No, Jerry. Oh, you need oh, don't you, don't, you can't oh, leave here. Okay, Jerry, Jerry tries hey, to make Jerry. a run hey. for the door, but the hey. team oh, doesn't oh, let him oh, get very oh, far. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's like that oh clip God. I saw. <laughs> Who are these guys talking? It's uh, this is like one of these fucking reaction videos to this oh. video. It's the first one I found. <laughs> yeah, that's glory old Jerry there. There he is. Oh. And he starts bitching about his back, and Chris Hans is like, "That's the least of your problems." Yeah, these cops. But watch, like if you fast forward, like Chris Hansen actually sits down while this dude's laying on the ground. <laughs> Chris just sits in a chair. He's just like, all right, whatever. Where is he? He's there he is. yeah. Oh, they dude, should have oh, no look, vent what, video, oh, bro. Look at look dude. at this look at this power this power position right here. I'm gonna move my webcam. Look at this oh. power position, bro. Look at it. Yeah, Chris look, is look at him. Tough. Look at him. Mm. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? This dude, this All is right, some Dick. Crazy Nobody cares shit what right you here. got to this say. Are annoying. You know who I am? Oh, cuz I've just uh, I've oh. said I would never do this and I did it anyway. Why did oh, you do it, Jerry? Cuz I'm stupid. Oh. It seems like your back is the least of your problems right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So That's I mean, hilarious. Yeah, I'm telling you, pay the five bucks to get uh, True Blue, because it, it, and then you get Bob's show. You get, and there's another show of Bob's on there, another true crime <coughs> show Bob did before. Okay. But you can still get the Strictly Speaking for free, but it's worth the five bucks. To All right. Get True Blue. That's cool, man. There's so many episodes of Chris Hansen just talking to perverts, which I just... I can't get enough of, to be honest with you. Now, it's, dude, have you, you probably haven't, but have you ever interviewed somebody that's a, that's been arrested or done jail time as a pedophile? No, can't say that I have. I did. And, man, it was a tough interview. I can imagine. I, I interviewed, uh, I'll say the guy's name, I don't care, Trip Eisen. He was a um, guitar player for um, uh, Static X and Dope. Yeah. And he got he got arrested for banging like fifteen year olds or something on the tour oh. bus, and he he did like twelve years of time. And I, they asked me to have him on, and I was really it, it's one of the only time you know me, dude. I don't really ask a whole lot of questions. I'm just like I, I mean, as far as like like if I book an interview with you, I don't really come to you first and say, hey, what do you think about? It? I just book it. Right. You know, and it's the same thing. This was one of the few, few times I ever, 
like I, I called Neely and I was like, Hey man, I don't want to bring the show down, the show's reputation down, <laughs> but I'm going to interview this guy. Do you care? And, and he was like, he didn't care. He was just like, don't, don't sell this guy as like awesome either. And I was like, no, I won't. And I, and I did a hard inter. I mean, I asked the guy point blank how he expects anybody to support his band when he's a convicted pedophile. Yeah. And the guy was like, well, I'm not actually a convicted pedophile. I got hit with some other charge or whatever. And I was like, all right, bro. But I talked to him for like 30 minutes and it was very uncomfortable. And, and, I, and I'll tell you, trying to talk to him about his dumb band after yeah. was really, really difficult. It was really difficult to be like, ah, oh, so what's the, what's the inspiration behind writing these songs? It's like, no one cares. You tried to fuck a kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Not funny, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it was definitely a really really tough one of the one of the hardest interviews I've I've ever done. But I was glad I did it because I like I like challenging myself to do stuff outside the comfort zone. And that was certainly outside the comfort zone. Yeah. <laughs> I think the worst I ever interviewed was a I interviewed a hooker on the radio. All right. And um, Cinnamon is what she went by. Obviously, not her real name. Sure, but she was a hooker out of uh, one of the hotels right over there in Independence. Right. Because I found out like there was just a bunch of them. I didn't realize that in Independence there would be that many hookers that were over there. But there was like a bunch because it's a nice area over there. And it was like a block away from the radio station. This, this broad was, you know, doing her thing out of. Right. And so I put her on one of the overnight shows and <laughs> I found her number on back page <laughs> That's and funny. I just called her up and told her who I was and said, I wanted to do an interview and she was like, oh, I'll talk. And so I talked to her and she was a uh, very forthcoming. Oh, right. did you have to pry a little bit? And I guess no. this is really turning like sexually weird, but I mean, did you just say, so tell me about your gig and you know, yeah, pretty much. I mean, obviously we couldn't get, like here, here so yeah. I couldn't say, you know, how many Can it be like, hey, how many dudes do you blow a night? Right. You know? <laughs> if you were taken in the eye, it wasn't anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> Asking, like, you know, how did you get into this? Why do you do it? And, right. You know, and how much do you make? And all this kind of so it was a, But it was a good interview. Sure. How how much did she make? It's like 180 for an hour. Wow. That's really not terrible. No. I didn't partake in her 180 an hour back then. I especially wasn't making enough money to partake. Yeah. Uh, but she was a she was a nice lady. She was How old, old was she at the time? At the time, she was like 40, mid 40s. Oh boy! So she's either retired or dead by now. Yeah, could yeah. Now she'd be in her 60s. Yeah, so she, I would imagine she's not doing it anymore. I hope not. But She'd be again, like, there's some guys out there that probably be into that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. She'd be a day stripper at Juicy Lucy's or something. <laughs> but if you think about 108 bucks an hour, if you're doing, what, like, I mean, say you did five guys a day, you're looking at almost a grand a, a day. Yeah, that's true. That's a lot of dick, though. Jesus. Is it tough work, though? I don't know. Is it? Uh, I mean, just. All right, just... if you can get laid five times a day and you spread it out a little bit, wouldn't you do it? Well, I guess she would be spreading it out if she's getting laid five times a day. But <laughs> the real question is... I'm just saying, if you do like a couple before breakfast, a couple after lunch, a couple after dinner, you're good to go. Yeah, just, yeah. I mean, how... Uh, there's something about that, though. You're saying five times a day. I'm just thinking of the clean factor of that. Yeah. Well, there's a shower, a hotel there. Yeah, I guess, but mm, that's Look, a lot of... Okay, but you that's a lot of hope, and everything got caught in the condom. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the choice of being her, a working girl that she takes. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm only gonna share this. I'm not gonna share the audio here. I mean, people can listen to it if they want, but I'm gonna put this this link in the chat here because uh, Gunner, I think, asked about the if it was comfortable or not. And he can hear it for himself because the interview, the interview that I did with Trip, is still up there on Rumble. 
the YouTube communists didn't get that one. Ha ha. So, so the link is in the chat room if anybody wants to. Is if anybody Rumble, wants to hear me me chatting with a. Is Rumble back up and running? Yeah, Rumble is back up and running. Even though Tucker now has joined Rumble. Oh, is he? He's on yes. Rumble now. Tucker has joined Rumble. Is that for his new media company? I don't know. It might be. I just got a yeah. message from Truth Social saying that Tucker is now on Rumble. Oh well, how about that? I know he just launched a new media company. That's yeah, like. I just love it. To, and I, and I know he, he's his CEO is Neil Patel, who is like a computer guru. So that that has a real potential to be something good. So that guy's got to be worth a ton of money. I mean, I can't imagine. Dude, I can't believe that Tucker's the guy. I remember when he first came on CNN, and me and my wife used to used to goof on him because he always wore the bow tie and stuff. Yeah, and he just looked like a dork. Now he's the biggest guy in in all of news. Then he when he went over to Fox. I really enjoyed him on Fox. Like I think it was the eight o'clock hour, nine nine o'clock hour, maybe that he started on it. And I thought he was great. I thought he was kind of quirky and funny. The hair was all fucked up and stuff. And I thought yeah. it was interesting. And then he moved and got a little bit more serious when he switched his time slot. I think to eight. Right. And then you know we all know what happened then. Yeah. Then they- Fox made the dumbest decision of all time to get rid of that guy. And they must not have had a firm non-compete or something because it's he's out there just doing it. He don't care. Yeah, he doing, yeah he's doing whatever. He just don't care. I, I wonder if maybe it's just whatever the lawsuit is will not even close to cover what he's making with all these ventures. Probably. That might be what it is. He's just like, what are you going to do? Take $50 million from me? Whatever. Making I mean, $300 million a year. How, how do you even make money on Twitter? I don't even understand. I mean, how do you do that? How on do you Twitter? make that kind of money on Twitter? Did Elon Musk pay him $300 million? They might have. They might very well have paid him to only be on Twitter. I mean, we don't know. We we have no idea how that happened, but I mean. There's all these social media ways to make money, and I have no idea how to do it and can't do it. Yeah, well, first thing you got to have is that kind of an audience. I guess you have to have a following, is that what you're saying? Dude, if if, if we had like you. (laughs) If every time we turned on the camera, 16 million people watched, we'd be making money somehow. Somehow, some way, we'd be making money. Because if 16 million are willing to follow you on Twitter, one million of those are willing to drop $10 on a coffee cup or something. <laughs> you know? Dude, look at Steven Crowder. Yeah. That dude does 90, what, $90 a year from every user, and, and what's he give him? A fucking cup. Really? Yeah, that's what you get, the mug club. That's what mug club is all about. It's wow. about you get a mug. I have one. Wow. I have one from when Lando was on there. Dave was nice enough to send me. A I was gonna say cup. you didn't pay the ninety bucks. Did no, you? I didn't pay the ninety bucks, but but uh, Lando gave me a, a mug club mug, so I, I do I have a lot of. I look at some of these jerk offs that do social media, and I'm sitting, and I call them jerk offs. Yet they're making money off of doing nothing but promoting themselves. Mm-hmm. Like Dude. And they're creative enough to get a following to be able to do this kind of shit. Because for what? Because they can dance and they stick it on TikTok. Dude, look at the dumb shit that we'll watch. Oh, I don't yeah. know about uh, my two favorite things that I watch right now, and I'll I'll tell you what they are, and they're both stupid. And I watch five hundred of these videos a week. There's a guy out there from Australia named Shami. Are you familiar with Shami? I'm not S H A M M I. It's basically jackass. It's it's a house with like five or six dudes. They're in a they're they're in a like a nice house together, and they just fuck with each other. I may have seen those guys. I mean, it, it's constant. It's you know they they take tennis rackets and smash tennis balls into their bat into the other guy's back yeah, when they're not looking, or yeah. or they drop wine and from this you know. Yeah, from I the watch top those videos of, too. I watch yeah. them constantly, constantly. I'm watching those and the other ones that I watch. Nonstop, the fucking kiss or slap chicks. Yeah, I watch them nonstop. Now you know those kiss or slap chicks are all. Every one of them is just an OnlyFans chick trying to troll traffic for their channel. And I watch probably a hundred kiss or slaps a day, every single day. <laughs> so when are we gonna get smart, you and I, and like 
Dude, I could move in with you for like a month, and all we gotta do is make videos <laughs> of like each other, each of us Dude, slapping each other with pizza or something. Yeah, I mean that that would probably do it. I I've said this to other people, and they get mad when I say it, but it is. I think it's the truth. We're too old. We're too old for it. Come on, we are. It's a young it's a young kids game. Dude, I watch I watch content of all of all stuff, especially the kind of stuff that I do. And the only stuff that gets traction is guys that are in their 30s. I thought about doing something like with my leg. Like putting yeah, my well, leg in like different positions and different like like my leg by a pool, my leg by like wishing you could jump in, like all kind of different things with the prosthetic leg. And see if something, but I, I'm too lazy, I think, to do Dude, it. Dude, if we truly want, I mean, I know the answer, but I don't want to do it. If we truly wanted to generate a show that would do 30,000 clicks, 30,000 plays an episode, or 50,000 or a million or whatever, it would have to be self help. We'd have to, we'd have to stop joking around. We'd have to be all serious. We'd have to be like, let me tell you how I've gotten through my tragic situation. We'd have to be that. We'd have to be that. We'd have to have guests constantly lined up. Uh, this is Bob. He got his hand cut off in a in a lawnmower accident. Bob, are you still afraid of lawnmowers? You know, that's what we'd have to do. That's, but it would work. I, I'm telling you it would work. Because I, I know this only from my books. My book about getting burned up. Has sold thousands of copies, thousands, and and who am I? I'm not famous. I'm nobody, but because it's a self help thing and because I was real, it's done tons of tons and tons of business. And and dude, even on your show, look at what's happened every time I've told those stories on this show. You get more response than anything else. Yeah. Same with you when you tell the the real honest shit about you going through your stuff. Way more response than when we're, we're talking about kiss or slap girls. <laughs> it's just the truth of it, dude. It's it's uh, it's it's what do you want to do? Unfortunately, making money is never is never based on having fun. It's really not, unless you're a baseball player. Jesus, you see that contract? Whoa! Yeah. And then Otani is smart. Yeah, I'll just defer it for ten years since I make fifty million a year in endorsements. That was brilliant. This dude yeah. is going to make fifty million dollars a year for the next twenty years, at least fifty million. That's so. What do you even need that kind of money for? What it's not about needing with- it, dude. If you had five hundred million dollars in the bank, wouldn't you want more? No. Do you really think you'd say that's enough? I'm done. Yes. I'm, I just don't want to make any more money. Yes. I don't think you would. You don't know you you wouldn't know what to do with yourself. Herb and I talked about this before. We both have the same philosophy. If I could be a major league baseball player mm-hmm. and sign a contract for uh, give me a, just a big number, fifty million. Yeah, and, and that's spread out over five years, so ten million a year. Mm-hmm. After two years, I'd retire. <laughs> I would say that's it. I'm done. <laughs> I got nothing left. Uh, you, know, you can keep the rest of the money, and I'm fine. I, I, I don't look at me. Do I look like I need a like a a, a big lifestyle? I I don't really want to change my lifestyle. I just don't want to have to worry about. But my lifestyle. but you're saying that from a place of not being able to. There's right, a but, difference. There's a difference of if you're. Don't forget if you if you had that kind of money, you're not going to be around guys making thirty forty thousand dollars a year either. Everybody around you is going to make that money. So you're going to have to kind of, you know, you're competing. And the biggest thing that happened, this is why I say everybody should always, you know, how much money do you want to make? Just a little more. Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know. You don't know what's going to happen to you, your family, your friends, the world. You know, Shohei Otani might have to, you know, for some reason, we might all of a sudden start hating Japanese people again. And then what? He's got to he's got to take take off and get out of here. I think the biggest fallacy in the world is people saying money doesn't make you happy. Well, I I think that I think at first it makes you happy, dude. Have you ever have you ever worked a job where you got a big raise? Like you went to a new job and you got a. I can honestly say no. 
<laughs> See, I, I can say yes, and I'll, and I'll tell you how it went. I went from, I was working at um, Bristol West Insurance over there in Independence. I was making 35 grand a year or 39 grand a year or something. I got a job going over at a phone company over there in the um, in the build same building as uh, ninety two three and and yeah. um, ninety eight in the was at the Huron building. Yeah. Um, I got a job over there for a phone company over there, ninety grand a year starting ninety from from forty from forty to ninety. It was a huge raise. Yeah. And I will tell you that first check that came in. Me and my ex were dancing. We were like, look at this fucking money. This is great. This, is, I mean, we went, we had the big dinner. We bought some shit, you know, just because we could. I mean, yeah. it was it was fantastic. And you know what? By the second check, it was just the way it was. No matter, no matter how much money you make, it just becomes what you get. I don't know, man. I, I look at it as... I've worked a lot of time of my life, especially over the past 20 years, where, man, on that Friday before or that Thursday before I got paid, mm -hmm. I was going to the grocery store down the street and I was sure. writing checks and, and hoping that they don't clear it at, mm -hmm. the, at the register because ain't nothing in the bank until the, tomorrow morning sure. when you know, that paycheck comes in. Dude, I, I, I did my that. last $10 and I... Yeah, and brought home ten one dollar burgers from Burger King because Hell yeah. it was that was it. And it, it, I look like a king because like, you know, hey, look at all these burgers we got. No, it was the last ten dollars that I had until payday the next day. Sure. And I you know, having money causes some of those issues to go away, obviously. And when that electric bill you're not worried about paying it, or that cable bill you're not worried about paying it, then that's a that's a different kind of life than I've led pretty much the majority sure. of my life. No, I older. get it. I get and it. I, so even if I made decent, I don't need Shohei Otani money. I need mm -hmm. average good money. That's sure. what I want in life. And and you know, I think maybe I'm different. I, I don't. I wouldn't. No, but, but again, it comes from it comes from not doing. It. I mean, I I make a pretty good living with the businesses and whatever. I do pretty good. And I'll be honest. I don't feel like I have any more money than I did back when I was doing the same as you, shuffling. Well, if I write the I dude, I and I did this. I used to write the checks, but I wouldn't go to the grocery store until four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Because I knew that the that the cutoff was three thirty at the bank. So that the check that I wrote at four would not even transact until the next day. Right. And then, I, and then by the time it actually cleared, it would be Friday. I mean, I played that game forever, <clears throat> and I bounced a shitload of checks. You know, I, I mean, I did. I bounced a ton of checks. And believe me, I'm not complaining about, you know, dude, I'm finally working again, so I'm mm -hmm. very happy with what I'm doing. Sure. And, you know, I'm working two, three jobs, but I, you know, at least have money to go and buy some stuff that I want to buy. Yeah, and it's great. And But, but do but you I'll think... say if I made good money... But do you feel money. now like you're in any better of a position than you did a year from a year prior? Today, I feel like yeah. I'm better off than I was a year ago. Absolutely. Are you happier? Yes. Are you? All right. I am. I am happier when I know that. Shit, I'm not going to get those ten burgers. You know, I'm going. To, yeah. And I'm going to get myself a, a nice wrap. You know, I don't outside. know. I'm, I'm going to be happy. <laughs> I, it's weird because I fight this battle with my daughter all the time because you know. While I'm doing fine, I really don't know that I'm getting paid today, tomorrow, next week, next month, three months. I, you know, I don't know. You know, I'm, whatever happens, happens. And my daughter's always like, she couldn't do that. She has to have the guarantee. And I'm like, the guarantee guarantees that you don't make any money. You know, in my mind, that's how it works to me. I can make whatever I want to. I just have to work more. And for me, when I, when I had a job... A jobby job where I worked and made twenty dollars, thirty dollars, whatever it was, an hour. You know, whenever I had those jobs, I was always miserable. I hated it, and it was because I already knew what was going to happen, so I just didn't care about the job. But don't you want some of that security with your checks coming in? Don't you? I have no reason to excel if I know I'm going to make the same amount of money. If I'm going to make 
$20 an hour, I got no reason at all to be the best in my field because I'm still going to make $20 an hour. I'd rather take a risk, bet on myself that I can be the best and get paid accordingly. Well, my question to you is, and I'm not trying to get personal with you. No, that's fine. I don't care. I don't care. But what happens if you don't get paid for a month? Then I don't eat, I guess. Dude, I came at one point, I came within two days of losing my house. When I first started my, my businesses, I was 88 days behind. And, and they were like, if you get to 90, we're, we're repossessing your house. Huh. Or foreclosing or whatever they say, foreclosing. And I found a way to get it done. So. All right, we got a, a, our guest on the line. Should Absolutely. Take a break or should we... Yeah, let's take, take a quick break. Um, quick there's... break and then we'll get right into it. All right, sounds good. Hang on. Does your company need fresh teas? Have you paid an arm and a leg for the ones you have? Worried about poor quality when you pay less? Stop worrying, Northeast Ohio, and visit us at www.wctees.com. At Wolf Creek Media, we're family owned, we offer simple pricing, and we're fair and honest. We even have an in house graphic designer and cover all your apparel needs. So if you need t shirts, hoodies, banners, or any other type of printing, call us at 330 353 9695 or visit us at wctees.com. That's wctees.com. A proud sponsor of the Seth Williams Show. Singer, I believe, correct? Marty yes. McCoy. Marty McCoy, yes. How are you, my friend? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This is a fancy show, guys. It looks amazing. <laughs> well, only the best for the big names, man. Absolutely. Come on. <laughs> Breaks and in the video playing. I was like, wow. <laughs> well, Marty, welcome to the show, man. Um, you know, I I know myself personally. I've seen you perform, but not under this name. You know, I obviously was a you know back in the day. Remember the Boba Flex name, and you guys certainly had a good run there. And now you're back as the Lonely Ones, man, and right on the cusp of your debut album coming out. So let's get let's catch everybody up, man. Tell tell everybody about the Lonely Ones. All right, so um, we started during COVID. We released our first on platform March 16th, the day the world shut down. Uh, it was beautiful timing. It felt like uh, we can get past this hurdle. We can get past anything. Um, so we, uh, we, you know, we got all ready and geared up and, and got our touring vehicle and rehearsed. And then all of a sudden, we couldn't go anywhere for a year and a half. So it was a, <laughs> that's a rocky start. Man. <clears throat> But uh, then the, the world opened back up, and we got on the road and, and <clears throat> had some lineup changes and a couple things happen. And just kind of really, I feel like right now we're really starting to hone our sound and starting to sound like the way we want to sound. Um, and it's going well. Um, get some radio play and uh, getting some uh, some eyes on the band. So, you know, nothing happens overnight. Nothing's instantaneous. And patience is very important. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's starting to pay off a little bit. Right How on. tough is that? How tough is it getting radio play these days? Um, well, like you said, I knew from the Bobo Flex years, I know a lot of these guys personally. Okay. So I, it's a little easier for, I wouldn't say it's easy, but I, I get like, there's certain people I can call that will answer. Um, doesn't mean they're going to play the song. If they don't like it, it's not going on the air. Right. You know, if they like it, then you, you never know. Um, so 
it's, I would say, I mean, it's still hard. It's still rough. Um, you know, you're going up against, you know, Ozzy Osbourne's new single and Avenged Sevenfold's dropping a new single. And so the song better be good. Right on. Dude, let me, let me pull back just a, a hair from that. Obviously, you know, we're, we're mentioning Boba Flex and I don't want to turn it into a Boba Flex discussion, but when you, when you've been in a band that people know, and then you try to carry on afterwards, that is notoriously difficult. And it, it's, it's really hard. What, how has that process been for you? And what has been difficult in that process that you maybe didn't see when you decided to, you know, retool and change the name and all that stuff? Um, so I, I think we lucked out because, um, Bowflex was such a personal, uh, personable band with the fans. A lot of people stuck with us. Okay. Um, we didn't start from square one. We started from about square three. But we purposely okay. um, didn't mention Bubble Flex a bunch. You know what I mean? We wanted to come out like, oh, this new this new band, where did these guys come from? And then people that knew would know, and people that didn't know just thought we were a cool new band. Um, but it's it's been, you know, going from uh, riding around in a tour bus and being able to pay your bills. <laughs> I mean, a couple of little things. We're, you know, we're doing all the driving ourselves, doing everything ourselves. I used to be able to lay around like a princess and get do sound checks and, ready. <laughs> and you know, then take a nap and play the show. Not like that anymore. Um, we're definitely down in the depths of the trenches. But I really believe in this band, and I'm having the time of my life, so it's worth it. You know, it's just it's kind of back to the back to the basics and back to the beginning and. and you find out real quick what you want to do. Right on. And, and you know, one of the things, too, and and this is this is probably the biggest testament to it, is you don't sound like the old band. There's a, there's a new flavor to it. To me, you guys, changing the name made sense because, or change, because you don't sound like the old band. You've, you've really adapted to what is coming in right now, which is that, that newer band. I don't want to say dirty honey style because I, I wouldn't say you guys are exactly like that, but you're in sort of that them rival sons, you know, um, yeah, world. Um, that's what we wanted to do was um, kind of be like lean more alternative rock. Um, right. Keep, keep a, a dancey kind of feel, um, an energetic kind of feel, and, um, but modern, you know what I mean? I didn't want to go back. So we don't want to just be a throwback band. Um, there's, there's some guys that are, smashing that and you'll never touch them they're blown through the stratosphere they've already got it locked down and that's not my thing anyway i you know i'm a i like modern music i like a lot of pop music a lot of dance music stuff like that i like rock and roll i like metal um but i wanted to do something a little bit different and then when jimmy took over on guitar everything just changed he's just a weird cool he's just got a style that as soon as he plays something I go, what was that play that again let's do that so chris is going to ask you about the music which i love by the way but I want to know, like, the deeper details. I like to dive deeper. So you're a good-looking dude. No offense. I'm married, so, you know, nothing to do with you. I've been moisturizing. But you're, you're a good-looking guy. And uh, I only, I'm only i trying to live vicariously through guys like you. So I imagine you on the road with the guys in the band, tour buses filled with, like, girls that are hanging out the window and stuff. How, what's the road like for you? Um, I'm driving um, a lot. <laughs> But there's a girl there on your lap while you're driving, no, right? The bus is uh, big enough. And... Uh, committed relationship. Um, Jimmy's in a committed relationship. We've never been those guys, really. Um, uh, our bass player, True, he's he's single, so he's he's a little wild. Our drummer, Tristan, he's the younger guys. They're they're, they're living their dream. They're doing the thing. <laughs> but, well, if you uh, need a roadie, an extra one, you know, yeah, you got our uh, our number now. Right on. Like I said, I, I, I'm in a committed relationship. I've been in this for a long time. Good for you. I'd rather have somebody to call at night and talk, you know, how was your day? How was your, you know, that kind of thing. And it doesn't sound very rock and roll. That's but, awesome. Though. No, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We're, ju we're just playing a little bit. Yeah. Dude, dude, talk a little bit about the full length release. Um, you know, you've done, you've, you've obviously done full length releases before, and they are, they're, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, but for bands, they really are an emotional commitment more than just laying music, you know, musical ideas together. A lot of times, you know, 
anybody that's that's been a fan of music for a while every every favorite band we have has 10 songs that were probably just as good to a fan's ear but didn't make sense to the band or to the emotion that you were capturing so how much of that did you have to fight through on a debut where you're really trying to make a mark not just for yourselves but to make a a big impact with an audience um that's a good question uh I like these questions, guys. I'm so happy. Uh, what's your influences? Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I write, like I, I put everything I got into it. Anytime you hear my lyrics on a page, they are deeply personal, usually very controversial. And like, what the hell did he just say? Um, so I, I feel very emotional every time. I, like when I'm writing, I'm like, am I allowed? You think I should say that? Should I let anybody know this about me? You know, this is very personal. Should I put this out there? And sure. I get that up and go, let's do it. And I usually call him and go, here's my lyrics. And he'll, if, he's, if he's like, oh, shit, and let's go. Those are awesome. Then I know. I For us, we've been working with the same people. I'm, I'm at the studio, actually, right now. Um, okay. In uh, Columbus, Sonic Lounge. One of my best friends I've been working with since, since I was 19 years old. Um, so it's a very, like, it's a very family-oriented kind of process. Um, nobody steps on anybody's toes. Everybody um, say what they got to say. Uh, if someone gets, I, I don't like that part. I don't go, ah, you don't tell me what to do with my lyrics or <laughs> right. Our part, I'm not really feeling it. It's a very open, um, democratic process. Uh, but I feel emotionally that, you know, I'm bearing it all. Sometimes when I, when I'm writing, I'm like, Oh man, this is heavy. I don't know if I'm, if I should you know, expose myself like this. Right, and, and and the thing is, is is well, you, the the thing is too, man. It is really hard. Like I, you know, I I say this all the time to to music to musicians. I write books about myself, and and that is not. It's not so hard to do. It's hard to take when people bring it back to you. When people say, "Hey, you know, who were you?" The question I get asked a lot is, "Who were you writing about?" Who were you talking about here? And a lot of times you don't kind of want to tell that part. You know, that's there, there, there's a reason like you as a songwriter probably wouldn't put a name of somebody that you're hammering and call the song that name. But but you know who it is and they probably know who it is. Where Where's the line for you as far as, you know, the comfort line, I guess, is what you will put out there versus what, what you do draw the line on? Um, I, I don't like to back on anybody, so I wouldn't shit on anybody. Um, there's too much of that. We got social media for that. Everybody, you know, it's a dark, dirty place, and, and there's so much negativity. And I'm, I, you know, I, I would much rather sing about things that people can connect with, and the way that happens is I sing about things that I've gone through. And believe it or not, there's tons of people who've been through the same stuff. You know, you're not the, you're not the only one, and. and the darker and more down in the depression and stuff you get, man, it's, it's weird how the more people like enjoy it and to tell you things like your song helped me and this and that. And I'm like, really? I thought it was very depressing and very dark and, and was afraid to put it out. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I, I know what I'm talking about. And I, and I felt that way before. I mean, I've been through alcoholism, you know, breakups. I've been through, you know, near death experiences, all kinds of things. Sure. Um, so, you know, I've got a lot of stuff to write about. I've, I've you know, had my heart broke a million times in this industry and I've had some major, big wins in this industry and it's always an up and down. Road. I think those are the cool things that you write about. You know, you, you let people know that, I mean, another thing that I do too, is I take a situation and then grandiose, you know, blow it out of the water. Sure. You know, yeah, you know, it's a story. So you know, sometimes, sometimes it's not exactly how it happened. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sometimes God didn't actually come down and touch me, um, but it felt <laughs> right. All right. So let me ask my my next question on my list here. Who are your biggest influences? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> so no, how like when you're writing a song? I know you got the lyrics and everything ready to go, but do you have a melody in mind? Do you have something? Do bands have that kind of? You already have the the. The music in mind to go along with your lyrics or how does that work out? I usually write the melody chorus. And if I feel like the chorus is good enough to sing back, then then we'll we'll start to move forward. If it's not, so it's trash. 
move on. So I, I can I usually write in my head and then grab the guitar. Um, but then but there's no you know there's no way that I, Jimmy will come with something. Sometimes I'll come with a full song like here's how it goes. Blah, 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 let the guys put their spin on it. Or we sit in a room together and something pops off or Jimmy comes and goes, hey, I got this idea. Um, so it's never really, a, you know, uh, a set way to do it. But a lot of the songs I write, I, I write them in my head and I'm like, oh, that, you know, in the shower or driving or some kind of mindless thing that that my brain can actually calm down and, and instead of just a million different things running around. Um, so I like to do that. I like to come up with the chorus up first. And if, if I feel like, okay, this is a big, this, this feels good. This is, this is something that I would be proud to put out, um, sure. you know, that be happy. Checks all the boxes with the emotion, with the melody, then, then we move forward from there. But if like that course is, that's nah, all right. Then throw the trash, never think about it again. Move on to the next. Thing. Do you ever all want to punch the uh, creator of Spotify or Apple music, like in the face? <laughs> Thanks for screwing up music because now we can't make as much money as we, we should be. Um, I mean, there's there's pros and cons to it, I guess. I, what I always said, was, I mean, the, mu- the musicians always get screwed over somehow, unless you're an uh, independent genius who is only not only a great artist but a great businessman. That's hard to do. You know, it's either usually one or the other, and then upon occasion, um, somebody like Jay Z comes through who can do it all. I'm not that guy. Um, but, you know, a, a bunch of lamp oil salesmen used to rule the world, but now we have electricity. So, I mean, the world moves forward whether you like it or not. Yeah, but you know what, man? It, it, you're right, but at the same time, the industry could do a better job at making it yeah. making it make sense. They haven't um, ever, so what's going to make them do it? <laughs> yeah, well, I, dude, I... I I mean, I don't want to get too far into this, but, but I mean, this is what I do in my day life when I'm not, when I'm not playing radio guy is I help artists get their royalties that they're not getting. And believe me, believe me when I tell you what I see is they don't care if you get your money because they get their percentage from Spotify. And you know, what, what drives me the most nuts just seeing it is every musician I know says that they're not making what they should make from Spotify, Apple Music, well, whoever it is. I don't want to name anybody specific, but all of them. And at the same time, Spotify puts a little graphic out and says, here's your, here's your wrapped, share it with your gr- share it with your audience. And everybody's like, yeah, this is the company that's fucking me over, but here's how many plays we got. It's like promoting them instead of promoting yourself, no? Yeah, it's, I mean, like I said, it's, it's a marketing tool. Before um, Spotify came out, and iTunes and people had to download it for ninety nine cents. Mm-hmm. We were crushing. Right. Everyone's like, I, not you know, I, I never lived through the days where um, a record label and you sold the record at the store and everybody came to the store and waited at midnight to get the new Guns N' Roses album. I mean, I, I wasn't in a band at that time. I was at the record store waiting for Guns N' Roses record, but I never came up in that world where you know song hits the radio all of a sudden you're you're doing really really well at least from touring and, and that kind of thing um i came up when it was kind of like that for a minute and then all of a sudden itunes was a thing right um, you, when we were independent and you were making 99 cents a download it's like it was it was pretty good for you know uh, more than i had ever made and then all <laughs> of a sudden you know it's like we're looking one day and we're like shit man we're making you know 15 grand a month just from itunes and then all of a sudden, boom, it's gone. And like, what happened? What happened? And there's this new thing come out called streaming. And uh, and it was over. Yeah, that just sucks, man. Well, dude, let's let's swing to better topics here. Um, you're actually um, in our neck of the woods here on Friday. You're going to be at the Outpost in Kent. And then, of course, you've got your, your um, release party on Saturday in Columbus. Talk about what fans can expect at the show. Oh, a lot of really cool stuff. Um, which one, the Kent show or the? Either one or both. Um, the Kent High show is going to be a good warm up for the, for the CD release party. Um, I'm I li- I moved to Florida. I moved to Orlando. So okay. I fly up to Columbus. Um, so I flew up on Monday. We've been rehearsing, you know, six seven hours a day, a day getting ready for these shows. We're going to do a co- some some really cool stuff. Um, we brought in a keyboard player. 
Uh, we brought up some backup singers. So we're going to have that whole kind of Black Crows vibe thing going. Um, nice. Which I'm excited about, you know what I mean? Uh, but, yeah, we're doing some new covers. And as as we do uh, Friday in Kent. going to be an awesome show. I love that club. And then we do the legendary Newport. And we're, we're going to sell our record at both places. Okay. Uh, Jimmy, the guitar player, was like, can, like we, we can't sell the record Friday. I go, why? <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> That's true. For a CD release, I go to a CD release party. I don't mean the CD's not out. It's like, we can't sell the record. Right. wants it, give it to them. Um and that's a crazy thing, too. We decided when the Lonely One started, it's like, ah, CDs, nobody listens to those anymore. That's not true. It's enough people listen to them that you can pay your bills. Okay. That's yes. Nice. We, we thought, we'll just do streaming. We'll leave, release a single. We'll do this. We'll do that. We'll hit the new model. And then at some point in time, we had enough singles that it was like, okay, let's put out a record just to have it on the table, just in case somebody asks. They're asking for it like crazy. Our pre-sale orders were outrageous. A record store just hit us up here in Columbus. Like, hey, people are coming to my record store asking for your records. Can you guys bring some, drop some off, we'll buy them from you. And, um, so, you know, people say a lot of shit, and it ain't necessarily true. Right. How about oh, vinyl? Oh, yeah. I was gonna say. Vinyl, I mean, that's, if you can get them, I mean, every, it's, <laughs> every vinyl pressing place is backed up for six months. Uh, not just the lonely ones. Even Tool can't get them for you know. Tool's got to have their record done six months before the release of the vinyl. Um, so yeah, absolutely. That me, if you'd have told me ten years ago, came to me and said, "Look, I want to invest in these vinyl machines." I said, "You're out of your mind." Mm -hmm. You've been and a hundred percent wrong. Um, it's wild that, back. but at the same time, all the kids are dressing like they're from the nineties, and this whole you know, retro hit. What seems you know, when I was younger, it was Led Zeppelin was retro, and, and I wanted to wear bell bottoms and play at Les Paul. And, and uh, now, you know, it's that cycle has happened again. Now the kids are all listening to the 90s music and, and wearing you know, pants, yeah. and, pants and, and, uh, and flannel shirts and, uh, and listening to, you know, the breeders and shit like that. So I'm happy about it. Um, and if they want to buy records and they want to buy CDs, we got asked for a couple. Like, Are you going to press cassettes? I was like, I don't think we're going to go that far. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, anyway. But you, you know what's crazy? That market is starting to pick up too. I, I'm more and more. I start seeing. I'm starting to see people that are releasing cassettes. You know, limited numbers, like thirty of them or something. But still, it's crazy that that's coming back too. So, so you know, I don't mean to sound like, but the internet. It's such a wild place. You can be huge in your niche market. Millions of people love you. you take one click that way. No one's ever. Heard. Yeah. Your own, your own world out there. You know what I mean? You connect to so many people. That's like there's the vinyl crowd, the CD crowd, the, the, you know, the reggae. Like I hear I, all the time. Like, if you heard of this reggae band, I was like, no, I haven't heard of it. Never heard this name before. And they'll show it to me. And there's, 50,000 people at this concert and it's like because <laughs> the internet is so you can get into whatever you're into and there are millions of people that are into the same thing so it's like you just never know that that's the good thing about the internet um you know we don't have mtv anymore uh so, haven't had that in 20 years yeah it's bizarre <laughs> how, how has touring changed over the years because i mean it doesn't seem to me i know in the cleveland area we don't have as many clubs and uh, as far as concert clubs as we used to have, has touring changed a lot over the years? Um, I, I mean, COVID, COVID closed down some venues, um, and that was a that was that was rough on everybody. Um, but no, I mean, touring's been pretty good. Um, the festival thing, the the big festivals, are a little different. You know, during festival season, um, it's be hard to play anywhere. And Columbus, Ohio, getting close to Sonic Temple. You know what I mean, right? People have people have spent their money. They got their hotels. They're ready to rock um, for that three, four day weekend. So it's kind of that kind of thing. You kind of stay away from out. If the festival's here, you got to be way out here in the country um, to kind of you know just because, like I said, you know people have already spent their money and, and concert tickets are are getting higher and higher and higher. So people are going to less and less shows, and they're picking the ones that they like. Um, Instead of just, I go to a concert every week or I go to see live music every weekend. It's like, things are so expensive right now. So hopefully the economy comes, I don't know. 
I, well, that's a, I was going to say, that's the problem that I have. Being a fat guy, again, we talk about this all the time, going to these festivals, I'm going to die out there, and I'd rather go see just a, a band play some of my local clubs, you know, go play the arena downtown instead of these festivals with, like, 200 bands. And then yeah. three days of me dying in the heat and the rain and everything else. I mean, what do you like better? I mean, you probably get more exposure, a lot of exposure with these festivals, but... Oh, love playing the festivals. Uh, for, as a band, un, incredible exposure. Um, and then, you you know, I've been touring for so long. Backstage is like a family reunion. You see this guy who's now working for this band. You see this guy that's now in this band. Or, or you know, you just see all these people, and it's just this wonderful thing. And, and um, it doesn't matter if, if you're playing, um, you know, Sonic Temple at noon. It's a massive opportunity. Sure. Um, and they're, they're awesome. It's just like as a band that hasn't quite got – that level to be on those festivals it's a little rough for us to to we got to strategically plan around when those festivals are going to be in town or what part of the country they're going to be at you know you always run the risk of we're playing friday night in cleveland but um tools playing down the street and somehow got jesus christ to open for them and <laughs> you know what i mean you always run that risk because it's like it's there's only so many venues and there's only so many places to play um but when the festivals come in, it's it's like you, you got to be if you're not playing it, it would be silly to play Friday night in Columbus, Ohio, while the Foo Fighters are on the big stage at the stadium that night. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, we're I, I'll tell you, we are anti. We are very, very anti Sonic Temple, not because it's not a great festival. I've back when it was Rock on the Range, I went three years in a row. So I'm not saying it's a bad I, festival. I, what I'm saying is it's killed Cleveland. Cleveland yeah. is a dead market in the summer because of that 100-mile radius thing. And and we get nothing anymore in the summer because everything goes to either Incarnation or to um, yeah. Yeah, or to Sonic Temple, and we're done. And it's wonderful for the fans. Um, you know, the, um, I get it, though. It's one of those things where um, I was, we're doing this, this show Saturday as a radio station-sponsored show. Mm -hmm. and talked about getting some headliners and stuff and they said the same thing said you know with the big festivals it's hard to get anybody to come in and um you know do a radio show because they're waiting on the the lineup for sonic temple and if they're on that lineup they can't can't do the show yeah um, so I, I, I never thought of that yeah it's it's yeah. it's it's definitely changed at least in this area it's certainly changed things it's changed but... the layout of, of music around here it really has i mean because we, we just don't get what we used to get i mean cleveland's supposed to be the rock and roll hall of, you know hall of fame town and everything else but we don't get rock concerts anymore because we're got, all going to these festivals so, so you guys have a rock radio station anymore uh we sort of mms sort of kind of plays rock music <laughs> yeah i remember when dayton's rock radio station went away and uh, when you know, there was at one point in time where we were rocking on radio and had single, uh, single just killed. Next year, we came back and a lot of the stations had changed the classic rock or changed to some other kind of format uh, just within a year with six months. I was like, we could definitely go back here. They, they, you know, they, they gave us all this love for a single, and all of a sudden, it's like the station is playing uh, polka music or something. Right, definitely. Well, dude, we're going to wrap this one up by uh, giving people a, a little piece of the video for Don't Cry For Me. Um, what can you tell us about the song? Um, so that song, we had a guy, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of The Biters. Do you remember the band The Biters? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, uh, Tuck Smith, the singer of that band, uh, pretty much the guy that ran the whole thing. He started another band and really liked his music and stuff and just started hanging out with him and, and uh, he produces bands. We called him and said, come up, man. Let's write some songs together. Um, this dude was wild. He rolled up straight from uh, Nashville in a van, drove over like a parking pile on that, jumped six hours to Columbus, jumped straight out of his van with an acoustic guitar, and we started writing for 10 hours like that. And, and so he helped write this song and helped produce this song along with Joe Veers, myself, and Jimmy, and the rest of the band. Um, this song lyrically is about if I something happened to me tomorrow and I was – I died. I had a pretty good run, man. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I'd like to take the lonely ones to the top, but if you know something happened and I got smacked by a bus, I'd be like, "Don't cry." I, I had a pretty good run, man. I've done a lot of things I didn't think I was gonna be able to do. 
Right on, man. Well, dude, before we play the song real quick, um, tell people where they can go to keep up with the Lonely Ones and buy, and I do mean buy merch and all that stuff. Um, so Lonely Ones on Facebook. If you type in the Lonely Ones and the picture of us comes up, you can get everything. So the LonelyOnes.net is our website, um, which I didn't even know people use that anymore, but they do, just like vinyl. Um, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Type in the Lonely Ones band. It's all there for you. That's Wait a second. And I want to say that I used it earlier today and saw that you guys have sweatshirts to fit a fat fuck like me. So I'm very happy about that. So you I appreciate that. And you guys rock even harder because of that. You don't look fat from here. <laughs> <laughs> Camera takes away 10 pounds on the podcast. Right. <laughs> Pretty good. I was like, that's not bad. Nice. <laughs> well, thanks, man. Well, Thank did- you so much for having me for checking out the band and, and taking your time out. It means a lot. And uh, we'll see you in Kent, right? You're going to drive yep. up. Yep, uh, on Friday. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, brother. All right, Marty. Later, guys. Take care, man. Peace. It's been fun, and now I'm done. I broke some hearts. I made some love. It paid for keeps. I cut my teeth on shiny things and shattered. up man good band. yeah good dude I like yeah him. marty marty's a good good definitely a good dude i don't know him though i i mean i i i've run into him because i i saw boba flex a bunch of times back in the day yeah but i'm glad for i'm happy for those guys man i i can't even stra- i didn't want to turn it into this that's why I, I just walked away from it but i cannot imagine how hard it is to have a band I mean, it's when when they when they ended Boba Flex, four of the five guys started the Lonely Ones. Right. It was literally the singer, the singer kind of got left or pushed out. I don't know how that went, but they just didn't feel they did the honorable thing by not carrying on the name right. without that guy, and uh, that has to be hard to give up 10, 15 years of establishment. You know, I mean, Boba Flex was a fairly, fairly well-known band. I, I, I'm aware of them. So, yeah, they had to be. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, they were. I mean, were they Metallica? No, but they were. Oh, yeah. They they had done. They had paid their dues. Where, when you're just when you're keeping four guys and losing one guy, I could easily see. Well, we're still going to call it Boba Flex. <laughs> yeah. You know, but but they. I'll give them credit where credits due. They started over. They did retool the sound a little bit, which is good. And um, I like what they're doing, man. I I hope they have nothing but success, man, because they're pretty solid, man. All right, so I guess we'll take a quick break here, and then I, we'll play this ridiculous dog pound details. <laughs> I mean, he put effort into it, so I guess I should play it. Well, he's probably and got something to say to you directly, I would imagine. We'll talk about that for a few, and then we'll wrap it up. I don't think Tony's joining us tonight. so Okay, all good. He's taking the night off to enjoy. So we will... Uh, be right back in uh, a few minutes after we hear from Bloom Doggy. From the winning Cleveland Browns reporter, Anyways, John Drake. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. It's Don Dockin. When I'm feeling nostalgic, I always go to Pinball PA. You got to go check it out. It's a lot of fun. When you want to have fun in Pennsylvania, there's only one place to go, Pinball PA. Located near the Pittsburgh airport, we have over 420 classic pinball machines and arcade games that you can play. 
Admission starts at only $24.99. Want to have a party? Well, there's no better place than Pinball PA. Visit our website today at www.pinballpa.com to get more information or to book your next small or large party. Pinball PA, it's where the action is. What's up, guys? John Drake here with the Dog Pound Details on the Seth Williams Show. Well, another week and another Seth Williams prediction down the drain. As Seth told us last week, the Browns will not win another game, and they went out and they won another game with some pretty solid quarterback play from the newly signed Joe Flacco as the Browns win a pivotal AFC matchup, downing the uh, somewhat formidable Jacksonville Jaguars. They came in 8-4, and four, uh, 31 to 27. So the Browns are now uh, sitting solely in the five seed in the AFC. They have the top wild card spot as we speak. At eight and five, there is a uh, train wreck of teams behind us at seven and six. So the uh, quest for the playoffs is definitely not over. Uh, I get a little nervous hearing all these people saying, well, it's pretty much locked up. And, you know, they're going to make the playoffs like, you know, Seth does make a good point that in Cleveland, we've seen some pretty crappy things happen. So I'm not counting any chickens uh, until they hatch into at least 10 wins so uh this week we have got the chicago bears coming to town a team that you know originally on the schedule um even you know for most of the season up until recently uh kind of looked like a cupcake game especially when justin fields went down with his injury uh but the last few weeks the bears have put together some wins and justin fields is back and he is looking damn good and i don't think we are going to see a replay of uh, that game he had in Cleveland a couple years ago, uh, his first start ever in the NFL when Miles Garrett just absolutely tore him apart. So uh, this is definitely going to be a difficult game for the Browns. Uh, the Bears uh, come in with a little bit of confidence. As I said, they do have, uh, you know, they strung a few wins together here. Justin Fields is playing well. I think the key to the game, and this is actually going to be a key going forward for the rest of the season in, the, in these remaining games against Houston, New York, and Cincinnati as well, is that all of those teams have pretty poor pass defenses. They're all in the low 20s, if I remember reading correctly. Uh, so you've got Kevin Stefanski with his shiny new toy, shiny new old toy, uh, Joe Flacco. Who can throw it downfield? He can, you know, make the throws to all levels. Uh, he's great in the play action game. So Stefanski, who loves to be pass heavy, now has the ability to do that, and he's playing four pretty poor pass defenses. My concern is that he's now going to turn to the run game. Uh, we've seen this before with Stefanski. I'm definitely not trying to, you know, sit here and crush Stefanski for, you know, <clears throat> in the middle of this, you know playoff push here i think he's done a great job this year but we've talked about it before everybody's seen it you know when he gets up against a team that is awful defending one aspect of the game be it pass or run he tends to do the opposite it's almost like he looks at it and says oh they suck at defending that i'm gonna do the opposite they'll never expect it it's it's dumb so as much as i hate to say this it would not surprise me with him going up against four you know at least three pretty bad pass defenses that he tries to run the ball against them. Um, that being said, I hope he does not. Uh, I think this week is an interesting matchup because the Browns defense plays much better at home, but this season we've seen they have not been good against mobile quarterbacks and Justin Fields is most definitely a mobile quarterback. So, they're definitely going to have their hands full. It's going to be interesting to see how this one plays out. You know, I think I think all, all of the remaining games on the Browns schedule are winnable for them. Uh, you know, I, I would say that the most difficult one would probably be uh, Houston next week, but they may not have CJ Stroud. It depends on where he's at in concussion protocol. Uh, that uh, week 18 matchup in Cincinnati against Cincinnati, they're going to have Jake Browning. And he's looked really good for two games, but he's a backup for a reason. Um, that's And honestly, that's another that's a reason why I'm a little hesitant with Joe Flacco everyone's anointing this guy and I'm like okay but he was on his couch for a reason um personally from what I'm seeing with the Browns I think that his poor season last year with the Jets was a result of the talent around him so I think now that you're giving him better protection and better weapons and whatnot you're seeing he still you know has something has something left in the tank to use that old cliche but um yeah this is going to be an interesting game this weekend I think it really comes down to uh two factors uh, very simple factors, and it was probably obvious, but uh, exploit the poor pass defense of the Chicago Bears 
and contain Justin Fields. I think if you do those two things, you can you can win running away. So uh, going to be interesting. Going to be great weather down at the lakefront. I will be there. So, uh, guys, go Browns. Hoping for a win this weekend. And, uh, Seth, please say that we're not going to win again because that always works out well for us. So, uh, until next time, guys, I'm John Drake for the Dog Pound Details. And, as always, y'all, go Browns. Hoo, hoo. Wow. Oh, he's, he's right on the money. A lot of fucking words to say that the Browns are going to win. And I don't think uh, – I think Billy, for once, is right here. Billy Morris checks in. This guy has no clue. Well, Billy. But what clue does Billy have? He doesn't even know how to return a phone call. That's true. He doesn't. Uh, but I'm going to ask if for, if for some weird reason I actually lose this bet, which I'm not going to do because yeah. the Browns aren't going to win another game. Uh, but if I lose this bet and the Browns actually make the playoffs – Maybe I'll ask Billy to make me some grilled asparagus on his. Uh, in his well, Billy, if, if anybody there. can make it taste good, which I like asparagus, but if anybody can make it make asparagus taste great, it would be Billy. So, Billy, if you haven't heard, the bet is if I, if the Browns make the playoffs, then I have to eat a pound of asparagus, and so I need you to make me something that tastes good because I've never had asparagus, and I wanted to. Uh... Asparagus is okay. It's not awful. Do you like yeah, green beans not, or not? I like green beans. Then you probably like asparagus. It's not that different than a green bean. A little soggier. Yeah, see, he, if he doesn't return your phone calls, Chris, then that's something. Because I understand that he doesn't like me, and so he doesn't return my <laughs> calls. And so I get it. Billy does not like me, and so he doesn't return my calls. But he, at least he likes you. He should at least return your calls. <laughs> Smoked asparagus. I would eat smoked asparagus from Billy Morris. I would too, actually. I'll tell you how it goes with Billy. I'll I'll talk to Billy, and I'll get about ten minutes in, and then he's always on the run. He's always got to get the kids somewhere, got to get something for Leah, got to get something for the studio, got to get something for the building, whatever. But I'm, I will call you back. I promise. I'll call you back this afternoon, and then three weeks later, I call him again. <laughs> <laughs> But it's fine. We haven't had any truth. Truth be told, we haven't had um, we haven't had anything that was like immediate need right now. I think if I if I truly had something that was immediate need, he would call me back. But See, I love Billy. I think Billy's one I of the too. best people of all time. Hard, I mean, I tell my wife this all the time. Like, I've never met uh, the people that I have surrounded myself currently, like yourself and somebody like Billy Morris. Billy Morris is an incredible worker. Oh yeah, like incredible. Like, he has his hands in so many different things, and he's been doing this for years, where he just Mm -hmm. puts his hands in a lot of different and just makes it work. Yeah. And, you know, I I give him a hell of a lot of credit, man. He's not only a talented musician, which is is, is good enough, but the guy just happens to just make shit work. Yeah. Well, me and him are doing something something in 2024, so. Well. And it won't be establishing phone calls. (laughs) (laughs) Great. Now I'm going to have two people that want to answer my calls. Nah, I always I always return calls. I, I barely ever answer my phone on the rings either, but but I do, but I do return. You got to admit, I always call back. You do. You call back. Yeah. yeah. So, good things. Good thing. Billy's a good dude. No matter. Now he's now he must need something. Nah, he doesn't need anything. <laughs> what the hell does that guy need? He's got money. He's got a hot wife. He's got... Kids that are fantastic. What the hell does that guy need? Yeah, I that guy was touched with you know, blessings from God. I know. He's if, if, everything. I mean, if if anybody truly sold their soul to the devil for their it's life, him. it's him. Billy. Billy did. Billy and and he happily signed the contract because oh my God has he been given it all? Yeah. Well, he works hard for it all. That's the other. Please, he puts Leah credit. to work for all of it. Leah works harder than him. Well, that's probably true, but he does work hard. So I, I won't give him credit for that. <laughs> Look at Billy, asshole. <laughs> no, he won't because that's Christmas week. Or he'll call. Go, call you. He'll call me for three minutes and be like, "Dude, let's talk about this after the New Year." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the call I'll get, dude. We got to get this stuff worked out, but let's talk about it after the New Year. I guarantee that's the call I'll get. Am I wrong or did Billy Morris? Yes, Billy Morris did help out with Coach for Kids. And Billy Morris also fed most of the police departments yes. in Northeast Ohio with his uh, smoke and rock and roll food truck. Yep, and still does. 
Yeah. They, they still do. They did. They did. You went to one, didn't you? Yeah, I've been to a bunch of those things. I mean, you went to one recently, like yeah, within, <laughs> within the last six months. Yeah. Yeah. I, so, I'll tell you what. He one day made me eat the Tommy Lee on camera. Do you know okay. Right. It's like a foot long, big ass, big ass dog. dog whatever yeah. it is. Right. And, and, you know, because it's a Tommy Lee, it's a foot long, whatever. And, you know, it made me all, all kind of references to me being, a, you know, a little bit, <coughs> whatever. Yeah. I like suck it on his big dog. Right. And, and But I'll tell you, his food, the best thing that I, I've ever gotten off that truck, and I've eaten a lot of stuff off that truck, but the mac and cheese with, like, those breadcrumbs, mm-hmm. and put some of that smoke yeah. brisket or whatever type, the barbecue brisket mm-hmm. on top, and add a little barbecue sauce to it, and, oh, holy shit, that's amazing stuff. Dude, for about a year, me, I worked on a project with Leah that should have taken about a week. But because Billy was cooking every time, it took a year. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, Billy would literally, I, I, I'll tell you one thing that he made. I, he probably doesn't even remember making this because he was just going through whatever bullshit he had in his house. He took hot dogs and he, he cut them into little tiny pieces and then he ran spaghetti up through this stuff. Yeah. And then he cooked it. And they took it out, and then he covered it with some kind of like Parmesan cheese and and some kind of some kind of um, tomato sauce. It's, it was so good, and it was hot dogs and spaghetti. But I mean, it, it wasn't like what you're thinking of as hot dogs and spaghetti. Right, yeah, I mean, right. this was like gourmet meal out of hot dogs and spaghetti. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous how good him and, and Todd too. I don't want. Them. Not put Todd in the mix either. Those guys can fucking cook. Todd's a crazy person, but yeah, he can cook. Yeah, he can um, definitely cook. He is nuts, but he can cook. But I, I mean, some of the best times were going to those police events, and I loved helping you know feed the police. Sure. And it was great, and Joe Burdick with his flags for the cops, and Billy with mm-hmm. his food. But like my favorite part was after I was done, Billy's like, "Get something to eat," and so go grab a big box and take it back to the station. Trivia would be trying to talk to me, and I'd be just chowing down. Yeah. <laughs> say hi to Leah. Every guy would like to say hi to Leah, Billy. <laughs> hi, Leah. Hi. <laughs> What's going on, Leah? I don't know if you're interested in one-legged guys, Leah. <laughs> but hey, yeah. if you've got a sister that likes fat guys, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now she Leah rules. She rules all by herself too. Yeah, she does. She's awesome too. I mean, I I got to know Leah pretty well when we were doing some web work together, and she rocks too. Billy, well, like I said, Billy hit the jackpot. They always everybody talks about setting the bar high. Yeah. Billy had Elon Musk launch a spaceship to set that bar that high. Yeah. And then somehow he cleared it. I don't get how that even happened, because uh, Billy's a low life piece of shit like us. Yeah, I know. And yet he he gets he gets Leah who likes uh, to likes to do all the manual labor stuff and is smoking hot and you know raises kids and you know lets him go off and be a rock star. It's like what the hell? Where's the penalty? There's got to be a penalty somewhere. He's going to hell. I mean that's that's what it is. I mean he's- going to hell. He's going to take the devil's chair for God's sakes. <laughs> Because he's been given everything on this part. Oh, everything. God. I'm done kissing Billy's ass. <laughs> we love you, though. Just answer your we damn do. phone every now yeah, and then. Yeah, no shit. Call and say hi. You know? <laughs> phone works in two ways, Billy. Not his. <laughs> he's got the one that doesn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's got a walkie-talkie. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're going to wrap things up. Browns are absolutely going to lose on Sunday. We'll talk you about that. You are an day. idiot. It, they are not losing on Sunday. Browns are absolutely going to lose on Sunday, but if they don't, Billy, start preparing a nice asparagus dish. <laughs> and uh, what else we got Monday? We'll figure something else out. I don't know what we have Monday. We're, we're closing out the year is what we have yeah, Monday. We're gonna be, we should do some predictions next week for uh, 2024. 2024. I know it's gay and stupid to do like predictions because it's you know, typical radio bullshit, but so I what? like it. So, yeah, so like then it. that's what we do. Uh, it's fine. I predict that hopefully not losing another leg. How about that? I'm going to predict Super Bowl, baby. No. <laughs> <laughs> not well, going that crazy. I'm not going that crazy. 
All right, everybody have a great rest of your week. Thank you for listening tonight. Thanks to Marty McCoy for coming on from The Lonely Ones. Yes. Thanks to Billy Morris for actually checking in, letting us know that he's still alive. That's right. And uh, God willing, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Chris. All right, see ya. See ya.